is indebted to H. Richard Niebuhr, for many years a professor of theology at Yale Divinity School, who in the year 1952 wrote an important book called The Meaning of Revelation. No book has had a greater impact upon my thinking than that book of long ago. That constituted lectures given in the United States and Canada during the years 1938 to 40, shortly before my teaching career began. Especially I've been influenced by the second chapter entitled The Story of Our Life. Here Niebuhr argues that a historical method is indispensable in the Christian community precisely because the gospel itself finds expression in the telling of a story or a history. Listen to his words. The early Christian community apparently felt that to speak in confessional terms about the events that had happened to it in its history was not a burdensome necessity, but rather an advantage, and that the acceptance of an historical point of view was not confining but liberating. The preaching of the early Christian church, he continues, was not an argument for the existence of God nor an admonition to follow the dictates of some common human conscience unhistorical and super-social in character. It was primarily a simple recital of the great events connected with the historical appearance of Jesus Christ and a confession of what had happened to the community of disciples. Students of theology, of course, are aware that the story form of the Christian gospel is not all there is to it. Faith that seeks understanding must go beyond the story. Following the lead of the prologue to the fourth gospel, into the dimensions of logos, a component element, you know, in the word theology. And students of theology, therefore, must have commerce with the ruling philosophies of the day in its apologia before the world. But Niebuhr was right. The proper and indispensable form of the confession of Christian faith is for the community to tell the story of its life. Niebuhr writes, we can imagine that early preachers were often asked to explain what they meant with their talk about God, salvation, revelation. And when they were hard pressed, when all of their parables or references to the unknown God and to the Lagos had succeeded only in confusing their hearers, they turned at last to the story of their life, saying, What we mean is this event which has happened among us and for us. Preachers still know that to be the case. In the first and last analysis, there is no substitute for telling and retelling the old, old story. Now, in this lecture, I cannot follow further H. Richard Niebuhr's discussion of the meaning of Revelation. I'm interested in pursuing an observation that he touched on only lightly. When early Christian preachers, hard-pressed in expressing their faith in Jesus Christ before the world, finally turned to the telling of the story of their life, they followed, said Niebuhr, in this respect, the prophets who had spoken of God before them and the Jewish community which had also talked of Revelation. These two always spoke of history of what had happened to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, of a deliverance from Egypt, of the covenant of Sinai, of mighty acts of God. Even God was defined less by his metaphysical and moral character than by his historical relations as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It may be added, perhaps, that this is the meaning of Pascal's famous statement that the God of the Bible is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not the God of the philosophers and the sages. Since Niebuhr's book appeared almost 30 years ago, a lot of theological water has gone under the bridge, and many theological bridges have gone under the water. <laughs> One of the big problems has been the word history. You theological students know that, and particularly the theme of God's revelation in history. It's interesting to note that Niebuhr, as though anticipating a hermeneutical shift that has taken place just recently, preferred the word story, at least in the title to his chapter, though he alternated with the word history. If you turn to Webster's Dictionary, 
you will find that story refers to, and I quote, a series of connected events, true or fictitious, that is written or told with the intention of entertaining or informing. Further, the dictionary says that this word has an ancestry that goes back through the middle, through middle English, story, to old French, histoire, to Latin, historia, and we are advised, see history. So, you see, there's a very fine line between story and history. In fact, in some languages, one word covers both. For instance, German, Geschichte. The biblical story is not history, if you mean by that a detached spectator's report of events. And the biblical history is not story, if you mean by that a tale that is spun out of the imagination of a storyteller. What we are talking about is a history-like story or a story like history. And that is precisely what Niebuhr meant by saying that we confess our faith by telling and retelling the story of our life. It would be wrong to suppose that the narrative mode is the only way that the ancient people of God confess their faith. Besides story, we also find other modes of expression in scripture, the poetry of prophetic speech, Proverbs and expostulations of the sages and liturgical forms in the Psalter. Nevertheless, it is striking that much of the Old Testament, more than half of it, do you realize it? More than half of the Old Testament is narrative. And if we go beyond the Old Testament into the New, we find that there the same holds true essentially as evidenced by the primacy of the gospel stories, the gospel narratives. There is much to be said for the thesis that the basic and characteristic way in which the people of God in biblical times confessed their faith was the recital of a story, a God story, which is the original meaning of the Anglo-Saxon term gospel. Gospel, Godspell, originally meant good story and by a change of inflection, God story. This kind of gospel or God spell the early Christian community inherited from the people Israel to whom they were united, as Paul said, as a branch grafted into a vine. The central part of the Hebrew Bible for the community Israel was the Torah, or to use the Greek term, the Pentateuch. I am sure that you theological students and ministers have come to recognize long ago the inadequacy of translating Torah as law, for instance, the law of Moses. This pejorative translation is redolent of legalism and may intimate that the Old Testament sets forth a re religion of law from which Christ has set us free. Now it is true that this body of literature, the first five books of the Old Testament, includes a lot of laws, stipulations at certain points. But fundamentally, the Torah is an extended narrative which begins with the story of creation and concludes with the story of the death of Moses in full sight of the promised land. Even at that point, however, the death of Moses, the story is open-ended for there is an anticipation of a continuing story of Israel, the people of God, into the future, into the horizon of God's promise. And therefore, the Pentateuch resolves into the former prophets, Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings. And the story goes on until the tragic event of the year 587 B.C., when the people were carried away into exile. But the story does not even stop there. It goes on beyond until in Christian conviction it reaches its climax in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the Bible opens with a Torah story. To be sure, this Torah story is composed of many individual stories. We all know that, the story of Paradise Lost. The story of the great flood, which almost brought the world once again to pre-creation chaos. The story of the Tower of Babel, the story of Abraham's test of faith in connection with his near sacrifice of Isaac. 
the story of Moses at the burning bush, the story of bread from heaven, manna in the wilderness, the story of the crossing of the Jordan River with the ark at the lead, and so on. Many separate stories, but these stories do not intend to stand by themselves as disconnected pictures of life. Rather, they belong in the sequence of one great story, a meta-narrative that embraces an unfolding drama beginning with creation, moving through various crisis points in the history of the people of God, and pointing to a consummation yet to be realized. The thing to notice, however, is that this story or history is told confessionally by a people who praise their God by reciting the story of their life. This observation helps us to understand why the story begins with a universal scope, a scope as wide as creation, and reaches its climax in the marvelous event of liberation of slaves from Egypt in order that they may serve God as free people who have a future in the divine purpose. And so the Torah story unfolds like a symphony in all of its movements, the creation and the narratives of primeval history, the ancestral history, the Exodus story, the story of the sojourn at Mount Sinai, the wandering in the wilderness, entrance into the promised land. Each of those aspects of the story has its own special character, but all belong to a symphonic whole. In telling the story and embellishing it, over a period of many generations, the people confess who God is, and they acknowledge that they are God's people. So it's appropriate that in Psalm 136, the worshiping community writes the story as its act of praising God. Remember how it happens in Psalm 136, beginning with the creation and reaching a climax with the inheritance of the promised land. And each of those sentences of recitation is punctuated with the refrain for the chesed, that is to say the faithfulness, the loyalty of God endures forever. That this liturgy in Psalm 136 is a retelling of the story of our life is evident from the target line of that psalm, which reaches its conclusion by exclaiming that Yahweh is the one who in our low condition remembers us, who liberates us from our oppressors, who provides food for all flesh. Let me turn now to a closer consideration of the theological significance of the narrative mode of Israel's faith for the identity of God, for revelation. In Psalm 136, which I just quoted, the worshiping community joins in ascriptions to Yahweh in a series of narrative statements. Now, the word ascription is a grammatical form in which an adjectival clause follows or even takes the place of the divine name itself. Examples from the New Testament are our Father who art in heaven, or God who said, let light shine out of darkness. These ascriptions, both in the Old Testament and the New, are usually formated, formulated grammatically by either using the relative pronoun, Hebrew asher, Greek has, which is translated as who, or by using a verb or a participle. What strikes me about these divine ascriptions is that very often they are narratives reduced to a single sentence, as in the prologue to the Ten Commandments, I am Yahweh your God, who brought you forth out of the land of Egypt. In these cases, the identity of God, the who-ness of God, is disclosed in telling a story, the story of our life. One of the crucial moments in the Torah story is the disclosure of the personal name of God. Remember the story of Moses' encounter with the God of the fathers at the burning bush. The story is recounted in the third chapter of Exodus. 
At the bush he was overwhelmed with a manifestation of divine holiness. Do not come near, the voice warned. Put off your shoes from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And there he was called into the service of this holy God, though you remember he tried to escape the commission by offering various excuses, one of which was that he did not know the name of the God who was dealing with him. Listen to what the scripture says. Then Moses said to God, Elohim in the Hebrew, If I come to the people of Israel, who are in Egypt under oppression, and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And the answer comes in evasive and cryptic terms. Here in Exodus 3, verse 14. Ehyeh, esher, ehyeh. Often translated, I am who I am. This sentence has troubled interpreters right from the very first, beginning with the Septuagint, the Greek translation. It's almost impossible, I would say, to build a theology of the Old Testament on that cryptic statement. There's general recognition that the answer given to Moses, Ehyeh, Esher, Ehyeh, is in some sense a sort of an etymology of the name of the God of Israel. That is to say, the Tetragrammaton the four letters that constitute the sacred name. And various explanations, various etymologies have been advanced. All of these etymological attempts, valiant as they are, are beside the point, it seems to me, for the meaning of any personal name is given in the context of the life story of the person who bears that name. Shakespeare's Romeo can say, hoping to stand outside of the rivalry of his family and that of Juliet, what's in a name? A rose by any other name would smell so sweet. But personal names are not mere labels which can be changed at will, for the name designates the self that has a particular history, a unique life story, Etymologies of personal names, including your name and my name, are interesting. But the meaning of your name and mine is given not by the etymology, but by the history, by your story. And to be introduced to a person by name, if that introduction leads into any depth of relationship, is to perceive and to some degree to enter into the life story of the person who bears that name. To me, there is nothing more theological, theologically exciting than the announcement found at the very heart of the Torah story that the Holy God, the one who is beyond our human world and therefore beyond all appearances and all namings, chooses to be known as the one who has a personal name, Yahweh. If you have a bent for statistics, you can check a concordance, where you will find, I am sure, that the name Yahweh, Jehovah in older translations, is far more, exceeds and outnumbers any other name, any other designation for the deity. From our scriptural or our cultural perspective, I should, should say, it would be best to concentrate on the general name for deity, God. That's what we usually do. It's hard enough, after all, to engage in God talk in American culture, at any rate. To believe that God exists is a major hurdle for many people in a scientific world where the God hypothesis is no longer necessary. But the Old Testament is not particularly interested in God belief in general. Atheism was not the issue in those days, for, as the psalmist reminds us, <clears throat> only the fool says in his heart that there is no God. No, the issue in those days was not the existence of God, but the identity of God. That is the question, who God is? And that was precisely the point of Moses' question at the burning bush, according to that old story found in the third chapter of Exodus. Now, our discussion at this point could profitably, profitably and easily lead off into ethics. That is, the question of how the people of God should live 
in order not to take the name of God seriously. That, however, is to anticipate the next lecture on the prophetic word with its insistent question, what does Yahweh, the God designated by this personal name, require of you? We're concentrating tonight on another subject, and that is the Holy God, who is beyond all naming beyond all of the phenomena of our world, has chosen to enter the human story, and specifically the story of life which Israel tells, the God who thereby discloses himself, God's self, personally, by being God in relation to us, by taking part in the story of our life. All of that is contained pregnantly in the personal name Yahweh. Hence, the core of the tradition is a story in which God becomes involved with a people. I am Yahweh, your God. That relative pronoun that follows, your God who brought you up from the land of Egypt, who did this and that, that relative pronoun was crucial right from the very first in Israel's ascriptions of praise, the beginning of the whole liturgical tradition which culminated in the book of Psalms, was a narrative expression of faith in that time of liberation when Miriam, the sister of Moses, and her companions danced and sang a song to Yahweh at the Reed Sea, saying, Sing to Yahweh, glorious is he. Horse and rider, he's cast into the sea. The distinguished Old Testament theologian, the late Gerhard von Rott, Maintained, you will recall, that at the heart of the whole Pentateuch, or in his terms, the Hexateuch, is a little story, a little historical credo, found in various places. For instance, the passage about the wandering Aramean in Deuteronomy 26. I'm not going to go in that. I'm going to assume that uh, you know it. The worshiper, you remember, confesses his or her faith in Yahweh by telling and retelling a story in which the narrator shifts from the first person singular, a wandering Aramean was my ancestor, to the first person plural of a shared story or history. As the confession continues, the Egyptians afflicted us. Then we cried to Yahweh. Yahweh heard our voice. Yahweh brought us out of Egypt, brought us into the land. Von Rott maintained that the whole Hexateuch is a blown up expanded, elaborated version of this capsule story. Von Rott may have been too optimistic in supposing that somehow form criticism could detect the antiquity of these narrative confessions of faith which come to us in deuteronomic form. But it is indubit indubitable that at the core of the Torah, whether you read the Torah in its final form, or whether you attempt to trace the history of traditions to its origin, was a narrative theology, a story of the God who displayed a special concern for slaves in bondage and who opened a way into the future. It is as though the people had no better or no more authentic way to express their faith than to say, like later Christians, what we mean by God is this event this liberating event that has happened among us and to us. Listen to the narrative words of interpretation at the story of Moses' encounter at the burning bush. Then Yahweh said, I have seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, it's true that other peoples of antiquity had religious stories, myths which narrated the way the gods and goddesses behaved in the heavenly realm and how the historical and social affairs of human life were affected by the cosmic realm. These myths even influenced the Israelite tradition. For instance, the Babylonian creation myth Enuma Elish, or the Canaanite myth of Baal, the storm god, and his female counterpart. 
But the Israelite story, I submit to you, was radically different from these myths in at least two respects. First, the Israelite story relates a crucial historical happening. In the 4th century AD, Sallustius observed that, I quote, myths are things that never happened but always are. The Israelite story, by contrast, tells about something that happened. In the experience of a band of slaves, their deliverance from oppression and their movement into an open future. And secondly, this happening, the exodus and all that was associated with it, was experienced and hence given narrative expression as an event of divine intervention into the human world an event of miraculous divine presence. God, whose personal name is Yahweh, is in the story, is in the history. Hence, you see, there is movement, there is conflict, there is tension, there is denouement. Everything that pertains to a good story. In the beginning was the story, the God story. The God spell. Now, all of this is very important for the church to know if it is to take seriously the theological witness of the Old Testament. <clears throat> but there's something else that must be said when we regard the Old Testament as a part of the story of our life. Namely, there are a lot of other stories, very, very human stories, which are drawn into the core story and which receive a new meaning when interpreted in this theological context. That's true with the Exodus story itself in Exodus chapters 1 through 15. The core story, of course, is the event of the victory at the sea, which Miriam celebrated with hymnic poetry the event which was experienced as the saving presence of God in a historical time. But the core story of the Exodus is now elaborated in a story which contains a lot of minor stories or episodes. The story of the two Hebrew midwives named Shifra and Pua, Exodus 1. The story about the rescue of the baby Moses from the Nile, which in some respects is reminiscent of a legend of the great King Sargon of Akkad. Moses' discovery of a sacred place out in the wilderness as he was tending the flocks of his father-in-law. The angel of death, the destroyer, that passed through the land to slay the Egyptian firstborn but left the Hebrew children unharmed, and so on. When you study the Exodus story, you find that it is composed of a lot of smaller stories and sub-themes, yet the narrator has skillfully blended all of these together in such a fashion, such an artistic fashion, that the completed, wonderful story glorifies Yahweh, the liberating God of the Exodus. It is the core story that interprets the narrative parts. Now let me try to illustrate my point by taking the most difficult episode in the Exodus story. The story of Yahweh's attempt to slay Moses at a lodging place in the wilderness. You have that strange story here in the fourth chapter of the book of Exodus, verses 24 through 26. When you look at the story by itself, it stands out as a separate pericope, a separate unit with its own beginning and ending. Outside of its present context, it once may have expressed the ancient belief in demonic attack that was warded off by the timely performance of the prophylactic act of circumcision. Let's just read this strange story together at a lodging place on the way. Yahweh met him, Moses, and sought to kill him. Then Zipporah, Moses' wife, took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet, genitals, a euphemism for genitals, with it, and said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. 
Then it was that she said, you are a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. Well, that story is a puzzler, and I must admit that I do not understand it. Just be thankful that it's not in the lectionary for next Sunday. <laughs> it may be that its meaning has been lost in the process of transmission. But if it has a theological meaning in Scripture, that meaning will be dependent on its function in relation to the core story of the liberating God of the Exodus. At the least, the episode functions to remind the reader that it is Yahweh, not Moses, who is in control. For Yahweh is the holy God, who intrudes into the human world with awesome and even numinous power. Notice that it's just after Yahweh's commission to Moses to stand before Pharaoh and perform marvelous deeds of power that Moses experienced that strange unfechtung, that strange attack upon his faith as he was on the way, so the scripture says, to perform his task. Well, let's not linger any longer with that difficult story, lest I get out into too deep water. When you turn from the Exodus story in the book of Exodus to the book of Genesis, the same hermeneutical situation prevails. Consider the ancestral history found in Genesis 12 through 50, which now constitutes the prologue to the Exodus story, Exodus story in the Pentateuch. This section of the, Torah, of the Torah is a catena of stories, sagas, or saga complexes, as Gunkel called them. As you read these vivid narratives, for instance, the Jacob cycle, you get the impression that the people are by nature very good storytellers and that they love to hear a good story. And there's a great profundity in the human love of stories. The great Jewish novelist Elia Wiesel begins one of his novels called The Gates of the Forest by telling a parable. When the great rabbi Israel Baal Shem Tov saw misfortune threatening the Jews, it was his custom to go into a certain part of the forest to meditate. There he would light a fire, say a special prayer, and the miracle would be accomplished and the misfortune averted. Later, when his disciple, the celebrated Magid of Mestrik, had occasion for the same reason to intercede with heaven, he would go to the same place in the forest and say, Master of the universe, listen, I do not know how to light the fire but I am still able to say the prayer. And again, the miracle would be accomplished. Still later, Rabbi Moshe Leib of Sasov, in order to save his people once more, would go into the forest and say, I do not know how to light the fire. I do not know the prayer, but I know the place, and this must be sufficient. And it was sufficient, and the miracle was accomplished. Then it fell to Rabbi Yisrael of Rishin to overcome misfortune. Sitting in his armchair, his head in his hands, he spoke to God, saying, I'm unable to light the fire, and I do not know the prayer. I cannot even find the place in the forest. All I can do is to tell the story, and this must be sufficient. And it was sufficient. The parable concludes with this line, God made man because he loves stories. So, from the very first, the art of storytelling has been characteristic of human beings, and perhaps of God, too, if we may take our clue from Scripture, who loves stories and takes part in them. The narrative mode is indispensable for our knowledge of God, for God takes part in stories. Well, we could illustrate this in various ways. I was going to turn to the story in the 22nd chapter of the book of Genesis, the story about Abraham's testing of faith, the near sacrifice of Isaac. But lest I uh, overstep my temporal limitations, I'm going to concentrate rather on a story found in the 32nd chapter of Genesis about Jacob's wrestle 
with an unknown assailant at the ford of the Jabbok River. Maybe you remember that story. Genesis 32, beginning at verse 22. We could spend the whole evening on this story alone. The story by itself is a separate pericope. As the Greek word pericope means, pericope, which contains the elements around and cut, you can cut around the story. You can lift it out of its context, its present context, and it has an integrity of its own. In that respect, it's like a parable in the New Testament, a separate pericope. This story has a movement of its own which has a beginning and an end, and within those terminal limits of beginning and end, it has its own dynamic. The story must have circulated by itself once upon a time in Transjordan, in the region of the city of Penuel, a city which we once visited, some of us, on an archaeological expedition. And in that region, it must once have inspired an eerie fear, like the ghostly stories told in America about night spirits that move about on Halloween. In popular lore, such night spirits, as in the case of Saint-Saëns' Dance Macabre, must vanish with the first signs of dawn. Read in that pre-biblical context, one can make sense of the stranger's exclamation voiced when Jacob apparently was getting the upper hand in that nocturnal contest, let me go, for the day is breaking. But that's hardly an appropriate exclamation to attribute to God, Yahweh God, who neither slumbers nor sleeps, and for whom the night and the day are alike. The old story is now interpreted by the story of Israel in relation to Yahweh with the result that it now carries a new meaning. It portrays the struggle of Jacob, and we are told in this context that Jacob represents Israel. That's his new name. It portrays the struggle of Jacob representing the people of God, and Yahweh God finally eludes his grasp. Out of this tremendous struggle, Jacob came bearing a new name, signifying a new nature and a new possibility of life, but he also went away bearing the wounds of the struggle. It's in this sense that Charles Wesley interprets the story, and rightly, in his great hymn, Come, O Thou Traveler Unknown. Maybe you know that hymn. Come, O Thou Traveler Unknown, whom still I hold, but cannot see. My company before is gone, and I am left alone with thee. With thee all night I mean to stay and wrestle till the break of day. Lame as I am, I take the prey. Hell, earth, and sin with ease o'ercome. I leap for joy, pursue my way, and as a bounding heart fly home through all eternity to prove thy nature and thy name is love. But I must restrain myself lest I move from lecturing into preaching. What I've been saying about individual stories within the larger Torah story could also be said with regard to stories found elsewhere in the Old Testament, in the book of Judges, in the rest of the Deuteronomistic history, that is, Joshua through Second Kings, in Ruth and Jonah and so on. These stories, for which were written out of concrete situations in life, give point and power to the basic story of God's involvement in the down-to-earth and intimate life of his people. And that's true even of those stories which at first glance do not seem to be particularly theologically or spiritually edifying. Heilsgeschichte the history of God's saving acts, the unfolding drama of the Bible, the story of our life, or whatever you prefer to call the overall narrative of the Bible which moves from creation to consummation, is not a separate story or history detached from our common life. But it is rooted deeply in and it embraces the concrete experiences reflected in old stories. This is the point that Amos Wilder made years ago, back in 1954, in his book entitled Otherworldliness in the New Testament. 
a book that I was rereading not long ago. In that book, he calls our attention to one of the most atrocious stories found in the Old Testament, 2 Samuel 21, verses 1 through 14, about Rizpah, the concubine of King Saul. Maybe you remember that story. At the instigation of David, who was supported by the sacred lot, two of her sons were given over to be put to death in order to placate the wrath of the Gibeonites and to stay a famine. The scripture says, he gave them into the hands, David gave them into the hands of the Gibeonites. And they hanged them on the mountain before Yahweh, and seven of them perished together. They were put to death in the first days of harvest, at the beginning of the barley harvest. Then Rizpah, the daughter of Aya, took sackcloth and spread it for herself on the rock. From the beginning of the harvest until rain fell upon it from heaven. And she did not allow the birds of the air to come upon them by day or the beasts of the field by night. Not a very uplifting story, I suppose. You wonder why it's in the Bible, for it's too reminiscent of the cruelty that goes along with modern politics as well. Amos Wilder writes, here is a savage vendetta on the third generation. Here is a priest very possibly manipulating the oracle, that is, the lot, against the innocent. Here is, if not the crucifixion of the living, at least an abhorrent exposure of the dead. Yet here also is a mother, is mother love against the sable background of error and cruelty. The point, he continues, is that such stories dis disclose to us the subsoil of common humanity with which God is always wrestling, the roots of faith, doctrine, and liturgy, which must never be separated from their flower. And I think that it follows, and I speak here especially to preachers, I think that it follows in our own time. If we are to make sense out of what God is doing in the midst of his people and in the world at large, we have to draw into the basic scriptural story of our life the rich narratives of birth, of adolescent turmoil, of falling in love and starting a family, of finding a job and making a living, of love of country, and even the tragic experiences of violence that fracture humanity. Wilder is right. The New Testament can easily drift into otherworldliness if it is not firmly grounded in the Old Testament witness to what Wilder speaks of as God's intimate commerce with the lives of men and women in ordinary experiences. Let me bring this discussion toward a conclusion by giving some practical advice to modern readers and, and interpreters of Scripture, particularly in regard to the narratives of the Bible. First. When you read and interpret the Bible, give attention to the genre, the type of a story, so that it makes a total impact upon you. Notice the major characteristics of a story. A story is a narrative that deals with human beings in life situations. You here could contrast a fable or a myth which do not purport to deal with human beings in life situations. Also, a story is a narrative with a temporal progression. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And finally, a story presents a situation of conflict, a plot which presses towards denouement or resolution. A story should be interpreted only its, in its entirety, only as the whole that it is. And second, when you read and interpret the Bible, notice the way the story now functions in its given scriptural context. Taken by itself, 
the story may once have had a different meaning in the prehistory of the text. Think again of the story of Jacob's encounter at the ford of the Jabbok. But the question is what the story intends to say in its present context of the story of God's people. This does not eliminate archaic holdovers or solve all problems for us. I think, for instance, of that puzzling story in the sixth chapter of Genesis about the marriage of the sons of God with fair human maidens. Or the story in the fourth chapter of Exodus about Yahweh's attack on Moses in the wilderness. But this does emphasize that the meaning of Scripture is contextual. And it is exegetically and hermeneutically wrong, therefore, when dealing with stories to lift a little section out of it or a sentence out of it and to ignore the impact of the whole and the way that whole functions in its present context. And finally, reading and understanding a story is an art requiring imagination. Imagination that does not view a story from the outside as a spectator, so to speak, but enters into the story with sympathy and with personal involvement. It's the testimony of many generations of readers and hearers that the biblical story and its component episodes has the power to draw one into the story so that he or she can fill in the gaps, so to speak, with our own personal experience. We are touching here, I think, on the power of inspiration, the activity of the Holy Spirit that illumines and brings to life the sacred text so that the story or one of its episodes becomes our story or my story. In any case, the story contains a power that prevents it from being buried in the past as an archaeological item a power that moves the story out of the past into the present and on into the future. This is one of the reasons why this story that we are talking about is not simply history in the ordinary sense, though it surely rests on historical events and realities. That's the way the Torah story is heard in the Jewish Passover Seder even to this very day. For the Passover Haggadah reminds participants in the meal that every person must look upon himself or herself as one who personally had come forth out of the land of Egypt. Says the Haggadah, for it was not alone our ancestors whom the Holy One, blessed be he, redeemed, but also us whom he redeemed with them. This is the way that early Christians read Israel's scriptures, too. They didn't suppose that Israel told a different story or a story that not, did not pertain to them or involve them. On the contrary, they believed that Israel's story was also the story of their life, that they were also sons and daughters of Abraham and Sarah, to be sure. The story took an unexpected turn with the death of Jesus. And not everyone could believe that this was actually the climax and denouement of the expectations and the promises of the open-ended and unfinished story. But in various ways, the continuity was stressed. For instance, by Paul, there in Romans 15, verse 4, whatever was written in former days, was written for our instruction, and he's speaking to us who are Christians, that by steadfastness and the encouragement of the scriptures, that is, the Old Testament, we might have hope. The Old Testament then belongs to the story of our life as Christians. What New Testament interpreters say of the stories and episodes found within the gospel story as presented in Mark or Matthew, may be said also of the episodes found within the Torah story or within the larger story of the people of God as it is set forth in the Old Testament. 
These stories, when read imaginatively and sensitively, are not just about other people, they are about us. As Amos Wilder puts it in his book on the language of the gospel, these stories locate us in the very midst of the great story and plot of all time and space, and therefore relate us to God, the great dramatist and storyteller. When that happens, in the power and illumination of the Holy Spirit, then the word is preached. And we can agree with Paul in 1 Corinthians 10, where he's reciting some of the episodes from the Torah story, episodes from the wilderness, and says, These things were written down for us, upon whom the end of the ages has come in Jesus Christ. 